Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. So Joe Biden's back from the border. And as he puts the finishing touches on a State of the Union address that, as I read on the terminal, is expected to call for higher taxes on the wealthy, more relief for the working class. It is unclear if he will be able to tout a ceasefire in Israel. Remember, that was the hope. As he said, hopefully by Monday we'll have this done. And that doesn't mean that it can't happen by Thursday. But with what's happening on the ground right now in Israel, there are a lot of questions about that. And that's where we start in a very busy day here on the north lawn of the White House with Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco, who is covering the White House for us today as the Italian prime minister visits just for an added layer of complexity in our geopolitical soup. Michelle, the president's got a lot to think about as he sits down with the Italian PM, and I suspect that Ukraine will be the top of the conversation. What can you tell us? That's right, Joe, and, and TGIF, a you know, wild week. You know, that 24-hour work here. week sounded, sounded really good uh, to us there. Um, <laughs> You've but done that today let's alone. Talk about, that's right. Let's talk about what the uh, Italian prime minister might be speaking with uh, Biden about today. Yes, you mentioned Ukraine funding. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about that from the general later this hour. We're bound to hear more yep. about that uh, today from the White House, from Corinne Jean-Pierre and, and from uh, John Kirby, who will brief later today. Uh, but it'll be the same mm -hmm. message that uh, Ukraine urgently needs more resources. Uh, Italy and uh, the U.S. both probably talking about more ways to find uh, more funding, more resources to get to Ukraine in their defense against Russia at a critical time, uh, just past the two-year mark in that war. Uh, the other big issue that we expect might come up today is just counter China competing with China efforts. Uh, so you had a number of announcements this week and this wild week uh, from the U.S. side about policies, including restrictions on Chinese electric vehicles and data security. Those might come up and see where the two sides might meet together and, and cooperate in a G7 manner and, and talk about other ways that these two allies can uh, counter China in different respects. Well, I suspect that the, the matter of Israel is another one on the president's mind as they try to formulate a speech here next week. Michelle, they were hoping to be talking about a ceasefire uh, as early as Monday. Is it still possible to happen before the State of the Union? Well, for sure, that's going to be on the agenda. That's going to be the focus of the president uh, alongside you know, drafting that State of the Union speech this weekend when he heads to Camp David. He'll, he'll head there uh, this mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, but, you know, what he said yesterday when he left for that dueling border visit yesterday uh, on the South Lawn of the White House, he told reporters, uh, yes, hope springs eternal that they would have a ceasefire by Monday. But then he, he followed that up saying, Probably not by Monday, but, you know, and, and the complications around talks with Israel on a ceasefire uh, just got more complicated with the uh, tragic shooting incident yesterday in Gaza that they're still trying to find answers for on the U.S. side. And President Biden saying he, he was hearing two conflicting reports, at least, of, of what had happened there and who was responsible. Um, and, of course, that kind of gets in the way of these negotiations around getting a hostage deal, a ceasefire deal, to get hostages out, more aid in. So it, a lot at work here. He's going to have a super busy weekend ahead of a very busy week next week. I guess it'll be time well spent at Camp David with what he has ahead of him. And you can read a lot more about what we expect in the address here on the terminal, as I mentioned, an increase in taxes on the wealthy, uh, Michelle, and plans to highlight the CHIPS Act, which of course is now beginning to dole out money here to chip makers in the process of reshoring. We'll see what else we get. I suspect that there could be some news coming next week on the border as well. You mentioned his visit. We didn't really hear any details, Michelle. Could we get a, an executive order announced on Thursday night? Uh, we'll see about that. I don't know if we'll have news from the State of the Union on that, um, but we do yeah. hear, you know, this is kind of a messaging battle right now. You saw from the dueling border visits yesterday, President Trump saying, you know, this is Biden's border crisis and Biden shooting back that he wants cooperation. He, he extended a hand, he said, to President right. Trump to join him in this fight. Uh, but we'll see. It's benefiting clearly from polling. It's benefiting Trump huh. right now to, to paint the president as, as not doing enough and uh, to continue to try to push House Republicans to block these things, which uh, sure. Trump so far has been successful in doing. 
Well, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you see the very split screen that Michelle is describing. Michelle, it's great to see you. Michelle Jamrisco reporting for us at the White House today. She will be in the Oval Office when the president uh, sits down with the Italian prime minister. And again, Ukraine is the purpose of this conversation as they try to find a plan B or are we on to C now? I can't remember. There was a plan D at one point in the House, and we want to get started on this part of our conversation uh, with a voice of authority. It's not very often we have him in studio, but retired General Ben Hodges is with us uh, now, senior advisor to human rights first, of course, former commanding general, U.S. Army Europe. It's great to see you in person, General. Thank you you for being with us in Washington. Uh, Where to begin with the matter of Ukraine? It's looking like if there will be funding, there will be a longer wait. And the administration was warning us at the end of last year Mm. that time would run out by about now. This is the first day of March. Are we going to start seeing uh, more of a deficit on the battlefield because of this? Or is Ukraine pushing the calendar, so to speak? Well, of course, this is a a terrible situation for Ukraine armed forces. Um, And it's also unavoidable. I mean, it's avoidable. This didn't have to have to happen like this. Um, I think that we're going to see ammunition uh, arriving from European uh, countries here over the coming months, which they should. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the fact that the United States is failing uh, to deliver ammunition is a terrible reflection, not just on the Congress, but also on the administration. Um, You know, everything starts with the objective. What's the purpose? And the administration has not explained why this is so important to America that Ukraine is successful. Mm -hmm. The assessment in Kyiv right now uh, is is aiming for July, that Russia could in fact punch through front lines uh, by the heart of the summer. What would that look like in terms of the war effort? Would that be a war lost? So um, I think actually Russia does not possess the capability to uh, to knock out Ukraine or to punch through and exploit anyway. I mean, they don't have the large numbers of mounted formations and troops and logistics that could exploit, like they lost, uh, Ukraine lost Avdivka about two, two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. There's been no real exploitation of something like that. So uh, what I imagine is going to be happening this summer, uh, there will be local tactical successes along the line by the Russian side. Uh, But General Sierski and the Ukrainian Armed Forces are going to stabilize this line for this year to buy time to build up ammunition, uh, build up uh, new units. They've got to fix their personnel system. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this year, I think, is more the year of industrial competition. Well, and to that end, we're told that even if Congress approves the money tonight, while you're still in Washington, General, We don't have the means to make all of the stuff that we need or that Ukraine needs, that this has become a manufacturing chain problem. And we're not talking about that in this legislation, are we? If $60 billion went out to our defense contractors here, what could they do with it? Well, of course, there are are a variety of assets that are available Mm -hmm. that just need the funding to, to deliver it there. But what you're really referring to, of course, is the manufacturing of ammunition. The old-fashioned stuff. <laughs> Which is what, they're, what is what they're asking for, as well as uh, long-range precision munitions. Um, you know, a little over a year ago, I was speaking to a gentleman in the Pentagon, and he said, we make about 8,000 rounds per month mm-hmm. because that's what we need for our own training. Mm-hmm. In less than a year, they, they quadrupled that number just by making it a priority and putting money on it. So the various companies that make ammunition expanded their capacity. And, I, you know, I heard uh, Senator Vance the other day said that America doesn't have the capacity to make more. Mm. Like, what? This is the United States of America? <laughs> and he's from Ohio. That, they, that Of course <laughs> there is industrial capacity. Is there enough political will to do it? Remains a big question around here. And the Europeans are looking across the ocean wondering if we're going to make good on this. At the same time, they've been slow to deliver shells to Ukraine. Can Ukraine count on its nearest neighbors? It's an excellent point, and and it's a fair criticism of our European allies. But, you know, even Chancellor Schultz, the uh, German Bundeskanzler, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, was out there at a groundbreaking ceremony for a new ammunition plant in Germany. And here's a guy that nowhere in his past did he ever imagine he would be celebrating the opening of a new ammunition factory inside Germany. There actually, I think, is a lot of ammunition in Europe, uh, but it it needs to be reprioritized. Uh, 
you remember the European Union announced they were going to find a million rounds to go to Ukraine. Yeah. They've delivered 300,000 so far. Right. It turns out about 70% of what is made in Europe goes to customers outside of Europe. So now heads of government need to reprioritize what they have. They're still asking for long-range missiles. Uh, I know that the Germans are, have been kind of on again, off again with this idea. Is there anything that we can do when it comes to advanced weaponry to help them right now? Yes. Um, the the long-range precision strike capability, such as the American Atacums or the German Taurus, mm -hmm. the British Storm Shadow, that there is no one weapon that changes everything. But every square inch of Russian-occupied Ukraine is inside the range of a USA Tacoms. Yeah. So in other words, every Russian headquarters, every Russian artillery, every Russian logistics site could be hit. There, there's nowhere to hide. Mm -hmm. Could be hit if Ukrainians had that capability. You know, for whatever reason, the United States, this administration has continued to refuse to provide that 300 kilometer range at Tacoms. The, the Germans are hiding behind that yeah. a, a little bit. Yeah. That would be more effective than something like an F-16 for Ukraine right now, would it not? Uh, well, certainly it would make a huge difference right now. The F-16s um, showing up probably, I think we'll see midsummer is, yeah. is when uh, the Ukrainians will be ready to employ them. It's one thing to fly them, but to employ them effectively like our great Air Force does, yes, right. you know, that's, that's an operation. Abrams tanks are rolling. I saw a video of one of them on the ground in Ukraine. Remember, the argument at one point was, this will not help. This will only slow them down. You've got a jet engine in this thing. You can't afford the fuel. Has it been a benefit, or do we not know yet? Well, of course, it was a, a whopping 31 that were provided. Yeah. Um, so now, 31 Abrams tanks, you get 31 of the best tank in the world. Yeah. Um, but again, this goes back to, to the uh, what was the objective. You know, the administration... Um, Dilly dallied for months and months and months about whether or not to do it, uh -huh. um, and, and I heard I heard so many criticisms of the Abrams tank. Oh, it's so much fuel, it's so right. much maintenance, and I thought, well, why the hell do we have four thousand of them in the, in the U.S. Army? Right. Sorry, um, it it is a great tank, but it you don't just take it off the shelf and use it. You, mm -hmm. There is maintenance required and, and training to get the full benefit of that of that great tank. Um, what really matters is how is it employed by the Ukrainians, and I'm sure that they'll pick the best place where you get the most effect out of it. Just got uh, about a minute left, General. We saw news of a hypersonic missile being employed by Russia in Ukraine. We're told that our Patriot defense missile systems cannot catch those. Is that a game changer if we start seeing more use of that technology? Well, first of all, I, I would never underestimate the ability of the Ukrainians to take what they have and make it better. Yeah. I mean, we've provided things, and, and then I like counterfire radar, and I found out that radar was even better than I knew it was. Wow! Because they were able to, you know, if you're getting if you're getting attacked by the Russians all day long, you get very innovative, very mm -hmm. creative, and uh, Ukrainians are among the most tech savvy people I've ever met in my life. So um, I think they will figure out how to use what we provide, what the Brits provide, uh, and they'll be able to. It's not about quality, it's about quantity. They don't yeah, have enough. Right. I know you're typically uh, living and working overseas, but you're always welcome here in Washington. We're always very curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, our thoughtful general, Ben Hodges, it's great to meet you in person. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course, great pleasure. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. This is Balance of Power. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The president will propose higher taxes on the wealthy and businesses in his State of the Union address next week. Welcome to the fastest show in politics as Joe Biden prepares to go to Camp David for the weekend to punch up his address to a joint session of Congress after another round of economic data that could be key to the outcome of this election. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington alongside Kaylee Lyons. It's good to see you, Kaylee. You made it to Friday. Happy Friday, Happy indeed. Happy Friday to you. We saw uh, data this week encouraging, I guess we could say, on inflation. At least it hit 
targets. Sure. But also today, the first drop in consumer sentiment in four months. Yeah, actually the biggest intramonth drop because this was the final read we got today, which dropped from the preliminary read by almost three points. That's the biggest intramonth, intramonth drop we've seen since March of 2020. And we all know what happened in March of 2020. That was the onset yeah, of the pandemic. So how much of a concerning sign is that, especially as we're seeing gas prices moving up? Oil hit $80 a barrel again on WTI for the first time since November today. Well, I'm glad to say uh, we have the voice of an expert joining us with mm -hmm. the view of the White House today. Indeed we do. Jared Bernstein, the chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, is joining us now live from the White House North Lawn. Jared, always good to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Chairman. When we look at data like this, which suggests that after a lot of conversation about consumer sentiment being on the upswing, maybe it is not actually that steady, perhaps not that sustainable, potentially still a little bit vulnerable. Does that make you nervous? Well, the three-month consumer sentiment index is up almost 25 percent. And that is a uh, much more reliable trend than this uh, wiggle we got off of the uh, movement from the preliminary, which was positive, to the final, which was negative. Look, your point about the gas price is, is a good one, and we're going to have to uh, keep watching this very carefully. But uh, I don't think anyone should change their view that consumer sentiment, consumer confidence uh, has been moving in a pretty reliable uh, way in a direction suggesting that economic improvements have been reaching people in a way that they weren't a few months ago. And those improvements, of course, reflect easing inflationary pressures, a strong job market, rising real wage growth, very strong consumer spending and GDP. So uh, any, any one month can uh, wiggle and bounce uh, one way or another, but the uh, trend remains uh, uh, solid in that regard. We're hearing talk, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you. Uh, welcome back of, uh, of, of a world in which there are no rate cuts in <laughs> this calendar mm -hmm. year. You know I wouldn't ask you about Fed policy, but I just wonder what that says about the strength of this economy and whether it's a runaway train. Well, I guess you have a lot of things going in different directions here. I mean, uh, we had some uh, inflation reports that came in above expectations, and then we had an inflation report that hit expectations dead on. We had a retail sales report that, if anything, uh, went uh, the other way, more cool than hot. Uh, we have uh, job numbers that have been exceptionally strong. I think you really have to, again, I think it's really important to look at the underlying trend. Uh, one of the most important mm -hmm. is the unemployment rate that's been below 4% for two years running. Uh, that's a great number. It's supporting, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, nominal wage gains that are beating uh, inflation. So real wages up about 10 months in a row. Again, a pretty reliable trend there. Uh, so uh, uh, one of my jobs is to, of course, uh, look at carefully and get all kinds of nervous about the high frequency data flow, but to really keep an eye mm -hmm. on the underlying momentum, uh, which remains strong. Well, you say the underlying momentum remains strong. You point to the strength of the labor market specifically. When you look at this economy, Mr. Chairman, do you see any sign of easing being necessary? Well, I'm not going to get into uh, what the Federal Reserve should do with monetary policy. What I will say is um, I just uh, was looking at some of the forecasts for um, Q1 GDP, and I've seen numbers that are in the 2% range. Let's call that something like trend growth. Now, look, the, the way these hydraulics work, as, as you too well know, is that if the economy is growing at trend, uh, the unemployment rate tends to stay around where it is. And again, my very broad theory of the case is that as, as the labor market remains strong and inflation continues uh, to ease, again, on trend, uh, continues to ease. And, and, and that, too, by the way, is a very reliable forecast. There, uh, uh, virtually every forecast I've seen has inflation uh, continuing to ease throughout the year. That's a recipe for rising real wages. Now, in an economy that's 70 percent consumer spending, uh, that's a, a good recipe for uh, continued uh, growth. I, I, I don't I'm not going to say, you know, anything about what the Fed should do there. Uh, but that is a, that is and has been a, a reliable recipe uh, to keep things moving forward in, in a good way for American households. Jared, I'm sure uh, you're looking forward to the State of the Union address. This is a big week ahead for the White House. I don't know to what extent you're involved uh, in, in contributing to the framing of the economic argument that the president is going to make next week. But we're reporting that he's going to call for some familiar ideas, higher taxes on the wealthy, 
and businesses. There are some other uh, things that we can talk about outside of the economy, but I wonder what it is that you're looking forward to message to the American people next week. One of the reasons I get to come out here and talk to you is because I don't get ahead of the president. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm, certainly, I'm certainly not going to do that when it comes to the State of the Union. Um, but what I can tell you uh, is uh, the last part of your question is very much on point, which is the message to the American people, not referring anything to, uh, to SOTU, as we call it around here, State of the Union, uh, but just uh, uh, the ongoing uh, economic recovery. And I, I guess I do think that this, this narrative tends to get lost in the hurly-burly of, of the everyday news flow, which I understand. I'm part of it. Uh, so are you. Sure. And, and we get it. <laughs> but let's pull back a second and think about where we were and where we are. Okay, When we, were, when we got here, uh, the vaccination rate was about zero. Uh, we had a great uh, uh, vaccine, but it wasn't getting out there. We had families and businesses looking really worried about getting to the other side of the pandemic. The president gets here, puts the rescue plan in place, gets checks in pockets, shots in arms, massive improvement in the vax rate. And here we are now, all these years later, in the midst of a remarkable recovery, particularly in the sense that people said we couldn't do it. I mean, economists, Tony economists, said we couldn't get the inflation rate down by two thirds without giving up a bunch of points on unemployment or on GDP. Well, I just told you we had a GDP north of 3% in Q4, tracking 2% in Q1, unemployment we've talked about, and all of this with inflation down two thirds off of its peak. So I would consider this pretty remarkable recovery. Now for President Biden, it only matters if it's reaching families at their kitchen tables full stop. If I go in and tell him, I go in the Oval and tell him about GDP and the stock market, he's going to want to know from me, how is that helping families like the one I grew up in, Jared? And I, and I will explain to him that we've got real wages growing for middle wage workers, growing for low wage workers. And in fact, they're growing faster at the middle and the bottom than the high end. So the economy is delivering the goods to a lot of working families as prices ease. Now, we've got more work to do, particularly on that price side. Uh, but moving in the yeah. right direction and, and sentiment indices starting to reflect that. Well, so on the price side, given everything that you just told us about how wages have increased, the consumption engine is still very much uh, chugging along, GDP growth stronger than expected. All of that indicates that the demand is not going down in the way that perhaps uh, was intended originally. And I just wonder how great of a risk do you think there is of a reacceleration in price pressures because demand has been so strong. Do you, can you rule out that we will see another upswing in inflation? Well, I think one of the things that we often do, and again, it's understandable, especially with the high frequency uh, reporting and uh, scrutinizing every, every day to report, is that we're looking at all these bank shots. If A happens, what will B and C mean for inflation? Sorry, we've got some noise in the background. Uh, <laughs> Business goes on at the White House. We understand, sir. <laughs> we, we, we love to see working people at work around here. Uh, That's right. One of the, uh, it's a tight long game. What, what I think we have to keep in mind is that the best indicator of inflation is inflation. All right. There are a lot of bank shots and a lot of ways demand can play through this. But the, uh, the, the, our own analysis at the CEA has been quite clear, and I think this is largely confirmed by many other economists who've looked carefully at this, is that the disinflation we've achieved thus far has largely come from improvements on the economy's supply side. In fact, that's almost axiomatic when you think of inflation easing two-thirds off of its peak without giving much on the demand side. It kind of almost has to be supply-side contributions. And our, our own work explains about 80 percent of the disinflation through supply chain unsnarling, through improvements in the labor force in terms of labor supply. We think there's still more room to run there. So it's not enough to just look at the demand side of equation. You have to look at the supply side as well. And you have to look Sorry. end of the day, beginning of the day, middle of the day, look at the inflation indicators, which again, have been have been easing solidly uh, with, you know, a bump here or there in any given month. I had an interesting uh, encounter with Tom Swazi earlier this week. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the newest Democrat in the House of Representatives, he was sworn in uh, Wednesday evening. This, of course, is George Santos's former seat. And he was asked by many of the folks who were there about how did he win? And he was talking mainly about the economy, a little bit about the border as well. But he he seemed to have a sense of what drives the angst, the frustration, in many cases, the anger 
behind the MAGA movement, Donald Trump supporters, and, and many Republican voters around the country. And he pointed to wages as the first thing. You make $7, $10 minimum wage, even $15 an hour. That means you're not pulling in more than 20 or 30 grand a year. You can hardly afford to live. It's impossible to guarantee you can send your kids to college, secure your family. And he said that is the root of all of this. What's the message to those voters who are looking to Donald Trump for relief? I think you, ask, you really have to ask yourself, who's fighting for whom? I think we saw this contrast at the border yesterday. Uh, this president is consistently fighting to solve the challenges uh, that we face right now. I think his track record in uh, challenge solving uh, on the economy is extremely strong. That's what we've been talking about for the last few minutes here. Uh, but I think the larger issue here, in answer to your question, is uh, which, uh, which, which person, which administration, is going out there and trying to uh, solve exactly the problem that uh, newly minted Congressman Swazi was identifying. This president wakes up every day trying to figure out new ways to help families like the one he grew up in. Most recently, that's been about lowering prices, going after junk fees, actually legislating lower prices for prescription drugs, for health coverage. The opposition wants to take that legislation away. They want to repeal it. Now, if you repeal something that's putting downward pressure on costs, guess what? Those pressures reverse and they go up. So I think it's a very clear matter of who's fighting for whom and who is essentially uh, trying to uh, create a sense of chaos and, and uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and dysfunction. Uh, this president is all about good, solid governance on behalf of working families, and he's got a track record to prove it. And we've got some great unfinished business in the areas of housing, in the area of child care, in the area of lower costs that we'd like to keep working on. Well, and the ability to continue working on that will obviously depend on uh, the outcome of the election in November. And on that note, Bloomberg, together with Morning Consult, just uh, released a survey yesterday of the swing stage, which shows Biden is behind Trump and all seven of those uh, that we polled. And on the issue of the economy, almost consistently in every state within the data, the feeling of the national economy is much worse than the feeling of the state economy or the local economy. As you get closer to home, people actually feel better. How do you make the rest that resonate nationally? How does, what can the White House do to make the feeling about the economy as a whole better if it's not so bad when you're just looking at your neighborhood? Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, the poll that matters the most is the one uh, uh, which happens when, when folks uh, pull the lever or fill in uh, the, the voting forms. And, uh, and, and, and those polls have consistently uh, favored uh, Democrats. Um, what I would say is that uh, we have to keep our heads down, not pay, not get overly absorbed in uh, the ups and downs of uh, the kinds of polls you just mentioned, uh, which have proven to be pretty unreliable, I think, uh, when it comes to actual voting behavior, and focus on very much you know, what we've accomplished and what we intend to continue to accomplish. When we got here, we had an unemployment rate that was unacceptably high. And the very first speech, economic speech that the president gave, he talked about the importance of getting back to full employment. Well, he did that. He got back to full employment very quickly, historically quickly, and we've stayed there. While we've stayed there, we've managed to work on improving the economy's supply side and unsnarl some of those chains, uh, helping to increase labor supply, helping to increase the flow of goods into our retail sector, and that's helped to ease inflation significantly. Meanwhile, he's legislated historic investments in the future in clean energy, in lower health care costs, in domestic production of semiconductors, domestic production of EV cars and batteries. So it's, it's a fantastic track record, and it's one we will continue to talk about. Now, the, the, mm -hmm. if you want to talk about some uh, in, indices, you know, I would argue that um, uh, a good question three or four months ago is why isn't everything you're telling me, Jared, reaching the consumer sentiment indexes? But you can't make that uh, argument so strongly anymore. Uh, we have the uh, UMISH sentiment up even with today's slip. It's up 25 percent over the past three months. So yeah. uh, it, it looks to me like uh, the progress that we're made is actually starting to be felt by more and more consumers. We're going to keep our head down and, and, and do all we can to continue to move in that direction. 
And Jared, final question for you. You've been very generous with your time today, sir, and we appreciate it. But other news today comes from commercial real estate lender New York Community Bank Corp. Plunging again, saying it discovered material weaknesses in how it tracks loan risks. Obviously, there are some idiosyncratic factors at play here specifically for NYCB, but to what extent is the White House concerned more generally about commercial real estate right now or broader knock-on effects it could have for the banking system? CRE has been on our watch list uh, at CEA for a long time now, so this is not uh, a new thing at all. Uh, what we try to do is uh, get uh, uh, away from any particular case and especially commenting on any particular case. So we don't want to uh, influence market moves at all in this regard. Uh, sure. What we're looking at is the what we're looking at is the impact on the economy, the, the dynamics, uh, the narrative that you and I have been discussing for the last uh, few minutes out here. And what we see are uh, bank, household and corporate balance sheets all looking pretty strong. Now, uh, there's been uh, some uh, increases in uh, in uh, debt accumulation. There's been some increases mm -hmm. in some default rates. But many of those, if you look at them historically, they're kind of coming off the mat. They're back to around where they were pre-pandemic. I think in, fr from our perspective, the most important thing is, are those balance sheets as such that we think that the risk of systemic contagion is quite low. And I would argue that they are. If you look at the debt service that okay. folks are paying as a share of their income, it still looks uh, quite low. And uh, that gives us uh, some faith that we're in a, in a good place with the buffers to absorb what we're seeing. Mr. Chairman, I feel like you brought us outside for outdoor class today. I feel like I'm back <laughs> on Boston Common. It looks like a beautiful one on the North Lawn. Uh, thank you for the seminar and for always being so generous with your time. Jared Bernstein is chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors Deep Dive Bureau. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.